Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining this session. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Learning from public engagement, innovation through climate citizen assemblies. And it's a pleasure to introduce the chair of this session, Dr. Alina Abershenkova. Thank you. Alina, over to you. Thank you and, and welcome to this session that looks at governance innovation on public participation and engagement, learning from citizens assemblies. Well, we find ourselves at the end of the first week of COP27 and uh, seven years ago, a broad coalition of citizens, activists, scientists, also climate diplomats and world leaders adopted the Paris Agreement. And it's fair to say we have come a long way in those seven years, but uh, the country's national plans uh, to address climate change and the pledges on the Paris Agreement are still falling short of the ambition we need, uh, as we all well know. Despite the call in Glasgow last year for countries to up their ambition, um, according to the United Nations gap, Emission Gap Report, since um, COP26, since last year, um, the new pledges submitted only take 1% of projected global emissions out of the atmosphere, which is really insufficient progress. And most G20 members would actually short, um, will be falling short of their promises for emission reductions for 2030. So we need to do much better if we need, uh, if we are able to actually keep temperature increase uh, to 1.5 degrees. And uh, the issue is that uh, in many countries uh, where ambition is still lagging, what we lack is political will and public support for climate action. And political will and public support are ultimately the fuel of net zero transition. And so uh, in order for citizens to support climate action, climate policies need to be fair, but they also need to, to be developed with effective and meaningful citizens engagement. And the growing trend of citizens assemblies around the world is a very promising development in this area. Just so that we are all on the same page, what are actually climate assemblies? Climate assemblies use randomly selected citizens, or what sometimes we call everyday people, non-climate experts, not politicians. They select people to learn about climate change, deliberate and make recommendations on different aspects of climate crisis. And the way they are selected is through so-called sortition process or lottery, which looks to select citizens that represent the average makeup of, uh, of the country or a region or a city, depending on where the assembly is taking place. So uh, one seeks to, to ensure there is a diversity of age groups, social and economic backgrounds, education, um, and uh, also attitudes and political preferences in some cases towards climate change. And uh, climate assemblies uh, aim to bring this wisdom of citizens, of everyday people to climate action. Um, however, to meet the purpose and to be impactful, climate assemblies need to be done well. And this is why last year, with the support of the European Climate Foundation, a Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies, KNOCA, has been established. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this discussion today on behalf of KNOCA's Management Committee and on behalf of the Grantham Research Institute. And um, in one year, we have managed to um, gather over 500 members to the network and uh, gather a lot of knowledge on um, how assemblies have been doing so far and insights on how they can be more impactful and more effective. And I'm very pleased to say we have a fantastic panel today of um, experts, uh, many of whom are members of Knocker, representing expertise from all around the world um, among the conveners of the assemblies, organizers, and also participants uh, from the assemblies ranging from national, regional, and global level. So I'm very pleased uh, to open this discussion. And our first panelist is uh, Susie Tonent. Susie is, uh, has been an engine and advocate for climate assemblies and has a wealth of knowledge. She was the head of the Secretariat of Scotland's Climate Assembly in 2020 and 21 at the Government of Scotland. So Susie, my first question to you is, you headed the Secretariat for the Scottish Climate Assembly. 
what was the main rationale for the government to hold the assembly? What was your ambition? And uh, what was the main value you think of the assembly? And has anything surprised you about the outcomes of it? Thank you very much, Alina, and um, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Quite a lot of questions in that, so I'll, I'll unpack it a little as we go through. In terms of the rationale, Scotland has quite a participatory approach to policy making. We have a legal requirement to have a public engagement strategy on climate change, and we have an interest in participatory budget making. So it was going really with the grain of the way we tend to work in Scotland. But the main rationale was that we believed it would lead to more legitimate, robust and effective policy. You mentioned ambition and our 2019 Climate Change Act set up the Assembly, but it also set some statutory emissions reductions targets, which are pretty challenging. It's a 75% reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2045. And it was really clear to us as policymakers that to achieve this level of ambition, every aspect of people's lives and the structure of society would be affected. And therefore, it was only right and actually only effective if decisions of this scale are reached with people rather than legislated by policymakers in isolation. As a policymaker, it's really useful to test the appetite for change and also what trade-offs people prefer. For something like uh, climate change, there are so many ways that you could address the issue and understanding where people would put priority um, is really important because people bring their own insights from their own lived experience and then they go through the process of learning and deliberation before they make recommendations. That means those recommendations are robust and appropriate. Policymakers can have quite a narrow perspective, but an assembly, because it's so much more diverse, will take perhaps quite a, a different view and a more considered view. So for example, the impact of a transport policy on people with mobility issues will be more thoughtful. If someone in the room with you as you're making the policy says, that's a great idea, but this is how we need to do it for it to work for someone like me. You asked, about the value of an assembly. And in a nutshell, for me, it's a mandate for action. In Scotland's Climate Assembly, um, the members produced 81 recommendations and a statement of ambition. And this really is a roadmap of policies with ordinary citizens setting out a concrete programme. So a goldmine for policymakers. It has policies that are legitimate and robust and effective because of the process that um, they went through to, to generate those recommendations and because of the type of people that propose them, as you said, you know, they're representative in our case of Scotland. And I'm confident that the policies that the members proposed will be reflected in the next climate change plan, which is the way Scotland sets out how it will meet its climate targets over a defined time period. And the next plan is due to be produced at the end of the year. And I've been assured by those who are involved in drafting that plan that the recommendations of the assembly members are absolutely going to feed through into that. Um, you asked if we had been surprised about process. We took quite an innovative approach by involving children and young people through a collaboration with Children's Parliament. So we had people um, that were aged 8 to 14 involved with that process. And I was surprised how over the course of the assembly, the adults really embraced the aspect of cross-generational dialogue and became advocates for the children's recommendations. And the other thing that surprised me about process was that we held our assembly online during the pandemic. And I was really struck by the level of engagement and the quality of discussions that we had, despite being online, which I think initially people had been slightly sceptical about. I think now we know that it absolutely can be done as we're doing right now. In terms of outcomes, um, a strong theme was really a desire for information to be available to everyone. So not just children or people who had been through a citizens assembly process, and not just about climate change, 
but also about the climate impact of actions or services. So, for example, asking for carbon labelling on goods so that people can make informed choices. And that was a really strong theme that people said, if only we knew, then we could behave differently. And so they wanted everybody to have that knowledge that they had gained. And the final thing that I would say on that was in terms of democratic engagement, I think often in Western democracies, there can be a lot of polarization and cynicism in political debate. And giving citizens this leadership role in setting a policy agenda really helps to counteract this. And at an individual level, we know of at least one assembly member who was inspired to get involved in local politics after being in the assembly and has stood for political office in her community. So um, I hope that covers all, all the bits of the question that, that you answered, but, but basically, um, yeah, really kind of inspiring process that really puts people, ordinary people at the heart of decision making and gives a mandate to government to act. Thank you so much, Susie, and particularly for uh, for sharing this cross-generational dialogue aspect, which I know Tila will build upon in her remarks as well. Um, but just very quickly, what advice would you give to governments um, and uh, maybe civil society organizations which are thinking of hosting or ho organizing a climate assembly? Um, well, the first thing I say would really encourage people to, to, to engage with it. I think it has been um, a really fantastic process for us in Scotland and it would encourage people around the world to consider it. Um, be really clear about what you want the assembly to achieve. Um, we already had an act, a climate change act and emissions targets, and we had a policy about poverty reduction. So what we wanted to know was how should we do it? How should Scotland change? What measures should we put in place? And so be really clear about what you're asking members to advise you about. Then I think you need a really structured process to embed the outcomes in policy making. So in our case, the Assembly Members Report was laid in Parliament and ministers were required in the legislation to respond within six months. And we engaged with parliamentary committees and set up meetings with 17 different Scottish government ministers and the assembly members so they could have a direct interaction. And we also spoke to civil servants as well. So it was really important to design from the outset how the recommendations that came out of the assembly would be embedded in the policy making process. And finally, I would say, make sure that you have resource, not just to support the delivery of the assembly itself, which I think is the first thing that people think about, but also when the assembly makes recommendations, how are you going to implement those recommendations and what resource are you going to have available to do that, to take it forward? Thank you so much, Susie, that's, that's great advice. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go to our next panelist, who is Tilly Pack. Tilly is a democracy artist at the Green Tiger Foundation, which is a collaboration platform for sustainable Estonia. And uh, Tilly has been organizing climate assemblies in Estonia um, on uh, different environmental challenges of today to enrich uh, decision making. So uh, Tilly, what was the motivation for the Estonia's uh, climate assembly? and? Uh, um, particularly interested, uh, why did you choose to focus on young people and, and also on just transition? And if you can also share what was the impact, um, in your opinion. Um, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello from Estonia, northeast of Europe. Uh, I'm Democracy Innovator, yeah. And um, to specify, we've organized two climate assemblies in Estonia so far. So the regional one that I'm going to talk and a local one with uh, one uh, city government. And we are in the process of kicking off more and more because this is our way of um, basically achieving the societal change and enriching democracy and the way we do decisions. But uh, then about the youth climate assembly shortly, I try. <laughs> A year ago, uh, we initiated a climate assembly in the oil shale region of Estonia, so that's close to next to Russia, and it was specifically with young people in between the ages of uh, 16 and 29. And the just transition process was going on and still going on in Estonia. Uh, and at that time, the just transition national plan was on public display, uh, public consultation. So, but the youth, the young people from the region, because they were not organized at all, and they were not involved in the process, like totally left out, we 
um, in a way offered this climate assembly as a great engagement format, but also kind of empowerment format to the responsible ministry. And it was a success, like we launched it, we organized it together. So it was um, virtual because it was, um, the COVID was very harsh a year ago. Uh, for four days, it was bilingual. Uh, so simultaneously in Estonian and in Russian, because in the region, there are in total 144,000 inhabitants, but that's mainly Russian speaking the region. So we had to have two languages. And we had 33 uh, randomly selected, but then representative participants between this uh, 16 and 29. If these young people would have been called to a very kind of regular and traditional consultation process, they would first not have showed up, I would believe. They would not have had the kind of skills to actually participate or to understand like where have we been, uh, where are we invited to? And they would have been mainly maybe individual opinions instead of um, kind of common consensus. And this is what I love about the uh, climate assemblies. I'm a dedicated fan <laughs> because that format gives the participants um, skills to contribute to policy making, uh, skills to discuss, to express your opinion, to uh, also uh, bring on uh, like debate. Uh, supplies with um, scientific expertise and knowledge on the topic so you have the learning and it guides the participants through a very carefully designed process that is kind of a safe haven for um, different opinions but also for creating the common understandings so instead now we have in the region uh, young people that are equal members, they have been invited to the Just Transition Steering Committee. Uh, so they are equal members and representing the voice of youth next to the industry, next to the trade unions, next to the local governments. They were missing there before, but they are there now, thanks to the Climate Assembly. So this was the kind of empowering part. Uh, then these young people, many of them, actually I have the background picture. So these are the Climate Assembly representatives together with our president is there. <laughs> so the president also met with them. Uh, they formed a separate uh, civic organization to actually raise climate awareness in the region and also um, raise collaboration skills because this is a huge problem, not only in that region, but uh, in Estonia in general. And um, of course, also the recommendation from the Climate Assembly, they in great deal were also accepted to the Just Transition Plan. But that was like for us as the organizers of the Climate Assembly, um, the recommendations, of course, are the kind of focus, but we achieved so much more than we ever hoped with that one process. So it was a win-win situation for the ministry, uh, who, was, who is respons responsible for the Just Transition process, because they wanted to get young people involved, but so that they would also be kind of inspired, you know, to with some kind of new formats. It was a win win for us because we continue kicking off organizing climate assemblies and also consulting the public sector uh, in how they can institutionalize them themselves, the format, because we show that, yes. There are results. You see, young people weren't active before. They are a bunch of people is now, and they gather more and more people all the time. The their voice is represented in this very official process of just transition. And so yeah, it it's a success story, I would say. Thank you, Tilly. Very inspiring experience and in particularly interesting. Um, how uh, young people have been effectively engaged in this process of designing a just transition plan. I think this is very high on the agenda, of course, at this COP as well. So definitely an experience hopefully many countries can learn from. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage our participants to post some questions. I hope we will have some time at the end uh, to, to engage with the audience. But uh, for now, I'm going to our next speaker, who is Claire Milieu. Claire is a Global Assembly co-founder. So she was one of the people who had a brilliant idea to hold the Climate Assembly at the global level. And she is also Knowledge Circle Lead at the ESV Foundation. 
Um, so Claire, uh, what was the purpose of the Global Assembly? Um, obviously very ambitious undertaking. And what have you learned um, how public engagement uh, can advance, uh, public participation can advance uh, climate action and particularly at the global level? Over to you. Thank you, Alina. <laughs> well, um, the Global Assembly for, for COP26 was the first time we tried to, to create deliberation, transnational deliberation um, at the global level. And so back in um, 2020, the, the, the idea emerged um, and it was uh, initiated by, by civil society with the, the support from institutions, uh, including um, Antonio Guterres himself. And what, um, what was done was a process of deliberation um, online, bringing together um, 100 assembly members from, from across the world, uh, using sortition, um, civic lottery, um, as, as the mechanism for um, identifying um, the, the, the location and then the assembly members. And Guillaume, who is on this call, who is, um, I know he's struggling a little bit with the connection and will speak in a moment about his own experience of being an assembly member. But what's, um, I think, quite important to say is that the, um, the makeup of the assembly was um, quite revealing of the, the diversity of the global population, you know, 50% of the assembly members were women, 70% were living on the $10 a day, which is the average, um, you know, figure at the global level. Um, uh, and then we, we um, follow the, 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 the population density and, for instance, we had um, 17 assembly members from India and, um, and um, 18 from China. So the, the idea was to try to show that deliberation was possible. So it was very much a prototyping year and we have learned um, a lot and we've got um, a team of 30 researchers who are currently evaluating the process and their evaluation will be uh, available soon. And we're about to uh, launch next week the, the report for the Global Assembly with all our learning. Um, and um, I hope people can um, take that on board. I would say in terms of the many learnings we're, we're making at the moment is reflecting on how these processes um, are not neutral. Um, and the word we've used with, um, with the Global Assembly is, is integrity, because I think it's important to remember that deliberation is very much rooted in, in Western uh, principles of, of Western democracy. And a lot of the assemblies that um, have been um, done have been um, delivered in, uh, in the global north uh, with a lot of assumptions, I would say, and myself, you know, as, as um, you know, white person, privileged white person from the global north with the best intention. I think what we need to, to acknowledge is that we bring our cultural values and beliefs into the, the process we design. And so that's one of probably the most fundamental learning for the global assembly is how do you design processes that are truly grounded in, um, um, in decolonization and depatriarchalization and, and all of this. Um, and I think we've got a responsibility to, to make sure that the processes we design are really suited um, for, for people um, on, you know, in, in circumstances that, for instance, you know, in, in this instance, Guillaume is joining us from the um, Republic the Democratic of Congo, and there's, you know, there are issues with connection at the moment, and how do you make these processes really inclusive um, from multiple perspectives? So we'll hear from, from Guillaume in a minute, but I don't want to take too much of his time. Um, thank you so much, Claire. That's that's fascinating, and thank you in particular for raising the importance, as as we think, and in particular beyond uh, kind of European domain, 
of ensuring equality and um, and accessibility of participation. Um, so very very interesting insights. I hope we can pick up on that um, in the in the discussion later on. But um, is is Guillaume with us still? I just saw him dropping. Um, yeah, it looks like his connection is struggling. So uh, perhaps until we get Guillaume back on online uh, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, I'm going to go to Dermont. Um, so uh, Dermont Turney is an associate professor at the Dublin City University. And Derman has been involved in a number of citizens' assemblies, not just on climate in Ireland, not just on climate change, but also on biodiversity, which is currently happening, and um, has been an expert um, witness to those assemblies, but also has written academically on, on the topic. Um, so Derman, um, first of all, I was wondering if you could share with us uh, the experience from the Irish Climate Assembly. This was one of the earlier ones and quite, quite a different uh, setup from others. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the experiences and the impacts of, of the Assembly in Ireland? Sure. Thanks, Alina, and thanks for the invitation to participate. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion so far. Um, so I, I guess the first thing to say about uh, Ireland and, and greetings from the uh, the very western edge of, of Europe, we, we heard from Tilly uh, earlier on from, from the other side of, of, of Europe and we're hearing from uh, elsewhere um, uh, around the world as well. Um, so um, the uh, one, one thing to say about Ireland from the outset is that we, um, when the decision was taken to, to run a climate assembly, it was building on a longer tradition of citizens' assemblies in, in Ireland, going back now uh, about a decade. Um, so we have had a number of different um, citizens' assemblies on, on a multitude of, of different topics. Um, first of all, run by academics, in, in, funded by philanthropy, and then um, as a kind of proof of concept, and then uh, from 2012 onwards, there have been a number of government sponsored, um, uh, but independently run uh, citizens assemblies. Uh, and uh, the, the the one in which climate change was, was considered, it, it was almost an accident that climate change was included on, on the agenda um, because the, the, the citizens assembly that considered climate change ran from 2016 to 2018. Uh, the, the biggest topic that it focused on both in terms of public profile and um, time weekends devoted to the topic was the question of Ireland's then constitutional ban on, on abortion. Um, uh, and so uh, it, it was into that citizens assembly that the topic of climate change was inserted. And it was only inserted as a result of an amendment as the resolution was passing through parliament uh, to add climate change to uh, the agenda, an amendment from, from the Green Party. So uh, one thing to say is that it almost didn't happen at all. Um, but, um, but from that um, inauspicious start, um, it really uh, gained uh, momentum. So the, the Citizens' Assembly deliberated over two weekends on the topic of climate change in the autumn of 2017. Uh, it it con consisted of uh, 99 uh, randomly selected members of the public along similar lines to some of the other models um, we have heard about uh, selected through a sortition uh, process. Um, uh, and it came up with it with a series of uh, ambitious recommendations on climate change at the end of the second weekend, which were um, which came as a surprise to me, the, the, the recommendations, and they came as a surprise to policymakers and observers. And in common with experience in, in other jurisdictions, they showed uh, that the, our, our, our conventional wisdom about public views on climate change, when the public are exposed to relevant expert in, information, is, is much more ambitious than, than, you know, that, than our expectations would uh, would suggest. Um, one other thing to note about the Irish uh, case is that it happened five years ago. So remember the context. This was pre, nobody had heard of Greta Thunberg. Nobody, there were no school strikes. That, that global kind of momentum around climate action uh, had yet to kick off, certainly here in Ireland, but, but I think it's fair to say in, 
in many other countries uh, as, as well. Uh, so, so the context in which the climate assembly took place in Ireland was, was quite different. Um, uh, and, and the other thing to note uh, about the, the Irish uh, experience is that now it, it is now five years ago, so we have the benefit of time and hindsight. We can see what happened because uh, a, a significant you know, half a decade has, has uh, passed since uh, the, the assembly met on climate change. And what, can, what we can see from the record is that not all of the recommendations were accepted. One or two were, so one controversial recommendation was um, not uh, accepted. Um, and that was around the treatment of agriculture, emissions from agriculture, uh, uh, which is a, a politically sensitive uh, topic in Ireland. But many of the recommendations uh, were. Uh, and uh, important, two important uh, recommendations that, that have been followed up and acted upon were a recommendation that um, climate change should be placed at the center of policymaking. And that found expression in the uh, amendment of Ireland's then climate framework climate law, which was a very weak piece of legislation. It has been uh, strengthened through uh, uh, an amendment, an amending piece of legislation that was enacted um, last year, passed into law in the middle of 2021. So these things take time. Uh, you know, it, it took four years for for that to for that process of fully implementing that key recommendation from the for the from the citizens' assembly uh, to, to to fully pass through. Another interesting um, uh, recommendation was around Ireland's carbon tax. So we had a carbon tax, but it it had remained at a relatively low level for uh, a long time. As a result of a recommendation from the citizens' assembly, um, the uh, the, the cross-party consensus was reached on um, a, a progressive increase in year year by year uh, of Ireland's carbon tax. Uh, and again, this is you know this is a topic that we would think ordinary citizens wouldn't like. You know, citizens we were le led to expect don't like paying more taxes. And yet, a very high proportion of the the the, the members of the assembly voted uh, for higher. Uh, for a, a higher level of, of carbon tax. So those are just uh, a couple of, of uh, instances of um, where, where the recommendations from the Citizens' Assembly have, have ended up five years uh, down the line. Thank you so much, Dermot. Uh, it's really interesting example and fascinating how the Assembly actually had a very tangible impact, uh, as you say, on lawmaking in Ireland and also on the specific policies implemented. And we're also seeing, for example, in France, um, similar uh, similar situation where a lot of recommendations that citizens made as part of the Citizens' Assembly get later legislated. Um, but yet, um, oftentimes, uh, we hear critique from climate activists and particularly that uh, citizens' assemblies uh, might delay climate action and um, their impact uh, perhaps uh, could be improved. Uh, so my next question is um, to you, Dermot, but also to the rest of the panel. So we now have some time for discussion. Um, how do you think we can make climate assemblies at different levels more impactful? So I'll start with Dermot and then who, any, anyone else who wants to take the floor, please feel free and for the Participants, please uh, post your questions and Q and A functions so that we can uh, we can address issues that are of interest to you. So, Dermot, please. Thanks, Celia. I might make three points in in response to that that uh, question. Um, in terms of how to make them more more impactful. Um, so so one uh, and this very much ties to Kanaka, the the network uh, sponsoring the, this uh, talk. Uh, one is around the value of experience and sharing uh, experience. So I mentioned that here in Ireland, we have now around a decade of experience of citizens assembly. So policymakers in the Irish context are quite familiar with this way, this, this, it, it, you know, it's probably no longer even an innovation uh, in Ireland. It, it's an embedded part of our dis decision making process. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't critics of, of the process, but um, it is something that policymakers uh, that they know they know what it involves, they know what it looks like, they're relatively familiar with it. But I know in, in other national contexts, 
that uh, it, it might be something more out of the ordinary. So, so I think networks such as Kanaka that, that allow for um, sharing of, of experience between um, policymakers uh, and other uh, actors, stakeholders, civil society who are more familiar with these types of processes and those who are less familiar but want to learn more, I, I think that's that's an important um, development and something that I, I know Kanaka is is focusing on. Um, the, the the second uh, observation I would make uh, is around um, the uh, institutions or, or the way we institutionalize follow up. Um, and I can I can say a little bit about uh, what what has happened here in Ireland. I know there are other models uh, in other jurisdictions, and and this isn't to say that you know what what we have done in Ireland is, is by any means the only way to do it, but it's it's an example of kind of institutionalizing the the follow up process. So the, the how it works in Ireland is that a special parliamentary committee is. Uh, considered uh, is set up to consider the recommendations from a citizens assembly whatever topic it, it is so there was one last year on gender equality um and that that then meets that happened with the climate assembly it will happen with the the ongoing uh, citizens assembly on biodiversity loss that that alina mentioned um and that meets for a number of months it, it consists of members of, of parliament members of both houses of parliament. And that really does two things. It, it allows for a further fleshing out and elaboration uh, of the recommendations, but it also, it, it, it is similarly a deliberative setting. So, you know, it is, um, it, it's not the cut and thrust of parliamentary, um, you know, we, we have a, a very Westminster style of, of adversarial, um, uh, parliamentary politics here in Ireland, the parliamentary committees are a more considered, more deliberative space to tease out the recommendations for, for a citizens' assembly. And they infuse the recommendations that, that uh, come out of the citizens' assembly with that um, representative democratic uh, legitimacy. So it, you know, it, it goes to the argument that who are these people? They weren't elected, the, the members of, of the assembly. So, so that that's um that that's how things work in Ireland, um it's uh, and and it, it then gives the the parliamentarians a stake in in the outcomes, um and and so so that, uh, as I said that that's just one model of, among many, but but I think um it's important from the outset to build in um some understanding and some expectation of what that follow up process will look like rather than just you know, plowing all these resources into running a climate assembly, and then you get to the end and you think, oh, what what do we do now? So so planning from the start that piece around impact and legacy is, is important. And then the the third and final uh, observation to make, and this picks up on uh, the, the the remarks of Susie and Tile around the voice of young people. So my my specific involvement in the ongoing uh, Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss taking place here in Ireland, is that uh, I was involved in running a Children and Young People's Assembly uh, on Biodiversity Loss. And I worked very closely with a, a former colleague of Susie's, Katie Reid, uh, formerly from the Scottish Children's Parliament, who worked with myself and a number of other colleagues to design and run this Children and Young People's uh, Assembly on, on Biodiversity Loss, which is, linked to but separate and parallel uh, to the the uh, the adults uh, citizens assembly and we just last weekend brought six representatives from the children and young people's assembly uh, to the adults citizens assembly for them to present their their calls to, to action and uh, so so i think that's that that's for me uh, kind of a, a new innovation but a, but a really important space and a kind of a new frontier for uh, deliberative democracy and, and climate uh, assemblies. Uh, we have a, a video capturing the um, the what what we did in the children and young people's assembly, and I'll put the link uh, to that uh, in the chat in just a minute if anyone wants to watch it back. But uh, I'll leave it there for now. Aline. Thank you, Dermot Wood. Uh, that's that's a really uh, great uh, insight and advice. Um, um, particular also on planning ahead for the intended engagement with the recommendations of the Citizens Assembly. 
Um, would any other panelists like to come in on this issue of how uh, we can make assemblies more impactful? Tilly, please. Yeah, I think the, you know, the climate or citizen assemblies in general are very standardized. Um, they have the strict standards that you have to follow, then you can name it as a citizen or a climate assembly. So in a way, it's the freeware for democracy. You know, anybody can use it, anybody can initiate it uh, un until the uh, standards are being followed. And there's so much practice and knowledge and kind of analysis articles, reports, everything out there already. So there's so much to learn from, from the mistakes also. So um, to respond maybe to the critique yeah, that their um, climate assemblies are delaying climate action, I would respond that, but then let's maybe design them more to kind of give the public mandate to very harsh actions that are needed to be made by the governments um, or regions or, or local authorities um, or, or globally or European wise. Um, or let's let's prioritize some actions, you know, they can be used in a diff for different uh, purpose in that sense, you know, let's make this purpose more um, clear, maybe a strict in Estonia, for example, we don't, uh, Jeremy, what you talked about, like that the um, follow up of assembly should be uh, paid more attention. This is what we do from the start, actually. We don't initiate one if we don't know what will happen afterwards. And, and for me, the assembly format, because it's so standardized, there's so much practice already, there's so much knowledge out there already, also from the lessons learned. They're, in a way, they are like a blueprint for democracy, how it could work. You know, it's knowledge based. It's very people come together. They, they discuss in a, such a civilized way, although there's like so diverse bunch of people, you know, and then, you know, deliberations and then the recommendations and the follow up should be like okay, implementation and all that. So it's a blueprint for democracy. So if we use it like that, I think then we can and we are using it already. So. We're not delaying climate action. Thanks. Thank you, Tilly. Great point. Um, and uh, Susie, next to you. I, th I think I think the only thing that I would add to the the points that Tilly and Dermot made are really just to um, repeat some of what Dermot said around the time that it takes to have an impact on policy making and the that tension which there often is and which is particularly felt by assembly members who learn about a global climate emergency and have a sense of urgency and a sense of ambition and then are feeding into what often feels to be a very slow process and uh, I'm not sure that we we managed it completely but one one way that you can address this as a policymaker is when you're initiating your assembly is to put in time frames from the outset and so one of the things which we said was that the assembly had to report by a particular time scale and then the government had to respond back to the assembly recommendations by a particular time scale and while that may put pressures both on the process um, and on some aspe some other aspects of it I think it also gives a framework that everybody knows that they're working to and kind of helps to manage that expectation around urgency and delivery. Um, and I guess the, the other thing that I think is, as organisers of assemblies that we have to do is to help the, the members to engage kind of more widely in the community and so that it's not just an, an internal kind of political process, but it goes out through the communities. And so that's a way to have a more immediate impact for members to have a more immediate impact that they have agency and they have the ability to influence things throughout the different levels of, of government. Um, and to to help them to to stick with the process over that kind of longer process that is not just a six week process that they do something, they deliver something and it's finished. But if they want to, that there are ways for them to continue to engage and to to stick with that process as it follows through into into policy making. Thank you, Susie. Really important points. And uh, this is particularly upsetting that Guillaume uh, lost his internet connection because we were looking, really looking forward to hear from him today as, um, as a Citizens Assembly participant. And he's a farmer 
in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Unfortunately, it rains very heavily at the moment uh, where he is, so the internet connection has come completely down, but he's going to record his contribution, which will be posted uh, later on for everyone uh, to listen because he has a really inspiring story. Um, but um, I think it's a really important point on how the members of the citizens' assemblies then um, engage after the assembly. And we have examples, for example, in France, uh, the, the participants have established an NGO and continue um, kind of keeping an eye on the implementation of the recommendations and also um, lobbying for more ambitious climate action. But um, I'm sure there are more examples that the panel members would bring. So Claire, um, you have the floor. Yeah, briefly, what I think is important to uh, maybe remember is that there's there's a th strong theory of change that if there's a strong mandate coming from a commissioning body, um, change, policy change will happen. But I think there's a bit of a naivety in believing in that because change is not linear. And we know that um, for policy to, to change, uh, we also need movement and and um public awareness to to support you know uh, whatever comes from these assemblies i think that's um something that maybe is is not spoken about enough in um citizens assemblies design is how do you create how do you support um people to really engage with these processes and they they sometimes tend to be um not reaching out to the, the 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 wider population and i think that's what we try to do with the global assembly is um share this idea that you need um wider engagement through popular culture for instance so how do you do you bring the narrative of citizens deliberation in in a way that is really accessible and that people can relate to and also um be be really um conscious of the, the the power and what's at play here and we know that for instance at cop 27 this year there are more fossil fuel lobbyists than there's ever been you know and that's the reality of what we've seen for instance with the french process where we had a really strong mandate from emmanuel macron and no filter commitment so the strongest mandate from you could probably expect a, a good good enough process with these failings but good enough uh, really outstanding recommendations and despite all of that the the climate and resilience bins that that came out of this was um, quite you know um a watered down and cherry picked version of of the the climate the, the the french convention's recommendations and why did that happen it's you know let, let's acknowledge as well that we operate in in political systems and these processes are are embedded in in this um, in this environment. So I think for me to have more impact, these citizens assemblies need to really grapple with with power and and how politics works and power play and not be naive uh, about it. Um, thank you so much, Claire. A uh, really important point on, on the importance of power. I see that uh, one of the attendees had a hand raised, uh, draw Mark, but uh, we don't. I don't think we have a capacity to give the floor directly. If you could type your question in the Q and A, and also the other participants, uh, please feel free to type your questions to the panel, and we will address them. But. Um, for now, I'm I'm going to ask the next question to the panel. Obviously, uh, this event is taking place in a global context, and um, you know, Claire, you already talked about global assembly and and challenges rising due to participants also coming from different political cultures. One question that I always hear is that are citizens' assemblies and kind of the deliberation, deliberative method that is involved in it, are they only suitable for um, helping climate policy and democracies, or is there potential for using climate assemblies or learning from climate assemblies and using them in countries which might not yet be considered um, democracies? Um, so who, who would like to tackle this one? I know it's, it's not an easy question, but I'm uh, really interested in your views. Yeah, 
Well, I'm obviously not an expert on this, and there are many academics working on, you know, what does deliberation look like in, um, you know, authoritarian countries. We know there's a lot of deliberation, for instance, happening in China, and we had with the Global Assembly, um, we had um, 18 assembly members from China, for instance, who took part in, in this process. And I think we, we um, the way we framed it, um, you know, with the global assembly, we, we used the, the, the concept of governance and we didn't use the, the terminology of democracy, for instance, uh, consciously to not exclude, because it doesn't mean um, citizens from this country can't be part of the deliberation and the discussion they they have a vital role to play um so that was a strategic decision for instance um to to use that and and ensure we could have assembly members uh from um countries in in current you know democratic transition or um we had an assembly member from myanmar for instance uh, which um, has, you know, been going through a coup um, back in, in February. Um, and it was really hard for this assembly member, for instance, to, to you know, engage in a way that was safe for him. Um, and that raised lots of questions around, you know, um, assembly participants' welfare in challenging political circumstances. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not possible. I think it, it needs to be very carefully handled and, and have the, the right expertise. And that's something I, I suppose we're learning. And, and uh, Professor uh, Nicole Curato um, is uh, coordinating a team of researchers working on this, for instance. So it will be, there will be learning coming from that. But Alina, I would like to listen to your response, actually, to your own question, you as a researcher. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Your mind. I, I actually I agree with what Claire said. I think you know um what what the challenging the challenging bit about running a deliberative process and the citizens assembly in an authoritarian country would be ensuring any sort of follow-up from the government. Um, because I think that's where um it's going to be very challenging. But nevertheless, I think uh, running uh, citizens assembly can empower citizens, uh, can can help also educate and engage uh, engage citizens and spur kind of bottom up action. And we are actually seeing this happening. And even in Europe, one could argue that uh, some governments, um, well, at at the moment, some governments in power might be less inclined to. Um, kind of democratic deliberation and uh, we're seeing many citizens assemblies being initiated by NGOs not by governments um, specifically for those reasons as well um, where where it's hard to, to get to get the support from the authorities and uh, this is precisely the impact they're getting kind of activating um, activating citizens and uh, pushing for more ambitious climate action bottom up so I, I agree with Claire there are considerations and how you run it, um, but I think there is definitely a potential. Um, anyone else would like to come in on this? Doesn't look like it. So um, I had one last question. I think some of you touched on that uh, in your remarks, but you know, we've we've run a project at Knocker looking at the attitudes of climate policy actors towards climate assemblies and uh, tried to understand some misconceptions as well. And it was quite interesting for me to find out that a lot of climate experts and um, in particular also civil society experts uh, would see little value in climate assemblies because they would say, why do we need to engage citizens who are not experts? We are an expert climate community. This is an incredibly complex topic. Surely we have thought of all the solutions possible. We know it all. Why, why do we need non-experts coming into that and how can they learn and come up with something useful in just a few days? So I'm just interested. I'm sure all of you have something to say on that, but uh, just just very quickly, maybe go around and, and share kind of your responses to this um, from your respective assemblies that you've been involved in. Uh, Susie, shall I go first to you? Yeah, happy to do that. Um, I, I guess the 
I, I would I would absolutely disagree that um, people have all the answers, um, even if they are experts on climate change or policy making. I think it's such a complex subject, and and finding appropriate, effective solutions I think requires a whole societal effort. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is. I was really struck that one of our um, academics who supported the assembly as an expert lead, I think came into the process feeling a little bit skeptical about the, the system. Um, and his conclusion at the end of the process was that he was absolutely converted to the process, that he was really struck by how quickly members, ordinary members of society grasp the principles of climate change um, and how, how quickly they, they learn and absorb really complex facts. But what they bring that the scientists can't do is that breadth of lived experience. So when they're making a recommendation, they're making recommendations which they think will work for people like them, not people that are international academics or um, heads of state or government, but people like them who have the challenges of their ordinary day lives. And they think that this type of recommendation will address the issue. And I think that is the value that a citizen assembly brings because you have lots of different people with lots of different lived experience. And when together they form a consensus around, we think this will work for us and our situation in our country, um, then, then that is really powerful and effective. Thank you, Susie. Um, Dilly. Yeah, I would continue what Susie just told. So in the in a climate or citizen assembly, it's like the mini society who makes decisions. And the format proves that if you provide the knowledge, the time, the atmosphere, respectable atmosphere, then ordinary citizens, I don't like the frame at all, but <laughs> everyday people, they they understand the topic. It's it's possible to make it clear. It's possible to kind of digest it through everybody's own experience and then values and the perspective to life. And then that also creates much more ownership um, around and behind these very difficult decisions that we need to make today and tomorrow because the topics won't get easier. You know, yeah, we're not living in a linear world. It's more and more complex. We will have more and more crisis. So we need to kind of upgrade the way we govern our societies, so to say. And another thing maybe I would bring in is efficiency. The same, the president of Estonia, when he met the, the young people from the Oishe region, it's not called like that, right? but it has a name also the region. Uh, he was like surprised that, wow, we just spent like four days virtually together in groups and, you know, as a collective, and you produce this report and these recommendations more than 20, 25 like like i'm i'm dreaming of a state that would work that efficiently so building on that it's like yeah it is actually a very efficient format it just demands you know a lot of planning it demands budget um it demands expertise and, and all the you know following the standards but at the same time do we know the cost of a bad citizen engagement like we we often don't know you know like the, the processes that have played that have not created more public trust um and and some like real impact so in that sense it's it is a efficient way to move forward thanks thank, thank you Tilly. that reminds me of a great quote of one of the assembly facilitators i recently interviewed she said um, the biggest learning from the citizens' assemblies for her was how how greatly we underestimate uh, the ability of people, um, actually. Um, uh, but uh, we have a few questions from the audience, uh, so I'd like to uh, to pose them and feel free, panel members, to um, uh, to indicate which one you'd like to go for. Um, so one very important one: How can we utilize climate assemblies? to go beyond and contribute to the improvement of climate literacy among um, less educated and marginalized groups of the public. Who would like to go for this one? 
So how can climate assembly help? Yeah, Susie, please. Um, I think what we tried to do in Scotland was to try to produce some quite engaging materials. Now, I mean, it's in the Scottish context. And so we tried to produce videos which are actually still available on YouTube. If you if you Google it, you can um, see the videos that we produced. And the idea was to try to make it as accessible as possible. And then once the um, assembly had finished, we produced an animation, so a little cartoon with um, one of the older assembly members and one of the children that had been involved through the Children's Parliament having a dialogue and explaining what the process had been and what the outcomes had been. And the purpose of that really was to try to um, explain to people not just about the assembly, but about some of the, the recommendations that came out of it. Um, but I think I think this this idea of climate literacy was very much a theme that our members were feeling really passionately about and really keen to to um, have a much wider understanding throughout public in Scotland about um, climate change. Thank you, Susan Dermot. Yeah, thanks, Sabina. And I can uh, in this context speak from the experience of the uh, Citizens Assembly on Biodiversity loss that, that's ongoing both in the Children and Young People's Assembly that we ran and the Adult Citizens Assembly, some of which I've been attending as an observer, the theme of education and, and awareness is coming through really strongly. Um, it, 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 I guess, didn't surprise me so much that that came up in the Children and Young People's deliberations because you know, they're, that's the world they live, but it, it's also coming through as a really strong theme in the deliberations of the Adults uh, Citizens Assembly, the need for for uh, education, for, for more in, information um, on, on biodiversity and, and biodiversity loss here in, in Ireland. Uh, and so building on or e echoing what Susie said, we have, um, because we were working with children and young people from the start, we tried to make the activities, the resources that we designed for the children and young people uh, as fun and, and accessible uh, as possible, but we're also planning, we're waiting to hear on a funding application um, uh, to uh, enable us to build on all of the materials and resources that we designed um, uh, and, and develop them into educational resources that can be used in schools and communities and, and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, so, so seeing that as a, a a kind of you know a, a, a legacy piece that that um it's the, the impact of the assembly isn't just what happens in in the room but that you 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 build um you you build forward from from uh, from the activities and, and all the work that, that goes into the assembly thank you dermot um i i hope you will be successful in in your efforts uh claire um yeah, building on what Dominic was saying, really, it's um, what we did with the global assemblies. We had um, community assemblies that people could initiate and run in, in parallel with the co-assembly. So the co-assembly was the sortition um, selected group of 100. But um, in the end, and that was, you know, um, you could say only 1,300 people took part, but that was... Uh, an interesting example of how you can actually support people to really engage with um, the assembly materials and contextualize it um, to what's relevant for them in their local community. So they had access to the same resources as the core assembly um, and they hold their community assemblies to, to discuss you know, what was coming up for them in their communities. And, and there was a, a, a wiki that was available and people translated into their own language using um, the, the resources and, and uh, examples from their community. So I think that's another way of saying you know, how do you bring the conversations beyond the walls of this assembly, which in a way are, you know, they are just a lucky few can be <laughs> selected. Um, and it's it's looking at what the um, some of the uh, academic um, uh, crowd calls the deliberative system. How can we embed deliberation much more widely into our society? And that's for me, that's one of the thing I'm really interested in going forward because I'm I'm wondering how you know how are we going to deal with polarization in our communities when 
you know, the crisis potentially unfolds more and adaptation is becoming a topic that we need to, to address much more at our local level. Um, so I think that's potentially a tool as well to, to bear in mind with when we design assemblies, I suppose. Thank you so much, um, all, of, all of you, for sharing these experiences on how actually citizens' assemblies and materials generated as part of the assembly and also people engaged uh, could actually go much beyond the, the, the participants and, and help engage broader society. I think really valuable examples there. Oh, we have very little time left, but can, can perhaps would someone like to very quickly tackle the question, what are the shortfalls, this comes from the audience, what are the shortfalls of the current climate assemblies taking place? And what do you suggest to have more effective and inclusive assemblies? Uh, who would like to, to go at this one very briefly? Well, Susie, I think you already gave some advice to policymakers. I don't know if you want to say anything specific in terms of shortfalls. And <laughs> in this I, I, I think for me, the, the biggest challenge is, is that following through process and making sure that, and I think others have spoken about this as well, that, and Chile particularly, from the outset that it's clear to everybody involved, whether it's a member or a speaker or a policymaker, how the assembly recommendations are going to feed through into the policymaking process. And that may take a short time or a long time, but to have a way of assessing that and then a way of keeping members engaged with the process. So I guess that's a shortfall is that we don't think about it enough and it, it's challenging and, and difficult but really really important thank you so much Susie very important point Tilly one minute yeah it's a huge question but maybe like what's the end goal or strategy of uh, organizing these assemblies that to think, think through that um, for example in Estonia we are just beginners but we dream of um, institutionalized uh, formats like that already at the parliament level, maybe on the Baltic states level, maybe on the European level. This is what we're kind of um, working towards too. And if you keep that maybe in mind, then it's easier to connect these like one off events also. Thanks. Uh, German, I'm so sorry the organizers are telling me we have to finalize this, but I'd love to thank all of the panel today and the audience for great questions and just to leave you with um, three key messages. I think the panel was very clear today that the political decisions and legal frameworks alone won't solve the climate crisis unless the whole of the broader society joins in. And um, helps build this lasting mandate uh, for ambitious climate action. And uh, climate assemblies are an important tool uh, for healthy democracies and for citizen participation, but they are not a fix all solution. And uh, it's important that we learn from the experiences uh, as we did today. And uh, we do assemblies right uh, to make them more impactful and more effective. And if you are thinking about organizing citizens' assemblies, please do come to Knocker, look at our website and engage with us. Uh, we have these fantastic experts who are with us today. Thank you for your time and for continuing sharing your expertise. Um, uh, thank you and have a lovely day. <laughs>